And I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the um, session called Natural Forest Ecosystems for the Climate and the Critters. I have some bad news and I have some good news. Uh, the bad news is um, William Muma, who is really an international leader in climate science and has been for 40 years, um, is in London right now. Um, at the Climate Group International Board Meeting, um, so he's unable to be here in person. The good news is that Ed Spencer and I are all here, and that Bill sent me his slides um, and a short narrative to go with them. It'll be a truncated presentation, but I hope to represent what is sort of the core of the message that Bill wanted to convey to you today. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is forests and what are strategies that can um, that forests can um, help us with climate change. And there are several that we're familiar with. Um, afforestation, reforestation, preventing deforestation, and what I'd like to talk to you about today specifically is proforestation. So if we talk about forest management, we could um, have new forests where forests aren't now. So that would require a lot of new land and that would be termed afforestation. Reforestation would be restoring forests um, where they've been lost, and preventing deforestation is obviously a primary tool in helping to retain our forests. Proforestation is an additional forest-based strategy to let trees grow to their full biological potential to sequester additional atmospheric carbon dioxide and slow the progression of climate change. So if you could just imagine that this is not me here, this is Bill, and he's a wonderful person. So just imagine that I am Bill, and um, I'd like to share with you the remarks that he sent about proforestation. And what he's realized mathematically from being on five IPCC reports, he was on the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that received the Nobel Prize in 2007. He's been the lead author on five IPCC reports and he's chair of the Woods Hole Research Center, um, recognized internationally as the leading research center on climate change. And he said basically that this is the most effective, quickest, and most cost-effective thing that we can do to combat climate change on the time scale that we need to address these issues. Oops. So Bill always likes to show this um, slide of Death Valley, and he says it says it all in terms of global warming. In 2017 and again in 2018, Death Valley set the record for the hottest month ever of any place on Earth. And obviously, this is not a healthy trend. Oops. It's well established that the reason that the Earth has already warmed by an average of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, or one degree Celsius, is mostly due to human society, releasing large amounts of heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere. And primary among these is carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, and from the loss of forests and other land use changes. So the destruction of degradation of forests, wetlands, and soils has reduced the, capa the capability and capacity of these systems to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so it's continuing to increase. And what he really wants to emphasize in his recent work is the particularly important role that forests in the Northeast can play in sequestering additional carbon dioxide. So he provided a um, little schematic of the carbon cycle. And this is from the 2018 assessment that's conducted annually by 50 scientists around the world. And you can see that emissions from fossil fuels and industry produces uh, 9.4 billion tons of carbon each year. <clears throat> uh, over the previous decade. And land use change, including harvesting forests, destruction of wetlands, degradation of grasslands and soils, release an additional 1.3 billion tons of carbon annually for a total of 10.7 billion tons. So uh, this doesn't even include additional amounts added by burning wood and some other fuels made from plants. But the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide is only 4.7. And that's because our natural systems are taking up some of that carbon dioxide 
and uh, kindly has removed at least six billion tons every year. Of this, approximately three billion is removed through photosynthesis, 2.5 billion has been removed by the oceans, and another 0.6 billion is removed by an unknown group of plants somewhere on the planet. So it'd be interesting to know exactly what that zoo of interesting species are. So, some important points about the natural systems and the carbon cycle. So one third of the carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere since 1750 comes from deforestation, wetland destruction, and land degradation. We need to get that back. This is a powerful way to address climate change. One third of annual fossil fuel emissions, as we've seen, is removed each year by terrestrial ecosystems. they currently remove only half as much as they're capable of removing. And this is all very recent data to try and look at the role that our land can play in combating climate change. And I'll just add that Connecticut is a signatory of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is a group of 19 states of which all the governors signed a commitment to essentially maximize the use of natural land to address climate change. Allowing secondary forests to continue growing can remove substantial additional atmospheric carbon dioxide. So this is essentially one of the goals of proforestation. Northeast forests in particular could increase biological carbon sequestration between 2.3 and 4.2 times current rates. And that's because in our temperate biome, we have a very high capacity for carbon storage and sequestration. And that's both due to our uh, cooler temperatures, available water, and lower rates of degradation than is found in tropical forests. Wetlands in the United States are only 5 to 8 percent of the land area, but they store 20 to 30 percent of soil organic carbon. So that's an amount greater than in forests. And forests themselves do store an incredible amount of carbon, and that increases over time. But wetlands are very powerful um, carbon sinks as well. So <clears throat> the take home message from those points, and some is including very recent science, is that restoration of forests and soils can reduce net carbon dioxide emissions by up to 3 billion tons of carbon per year. So it's a very powerful system. While we work on renewables, we need to increase negative emissions and use our natural systems which are available and working for us now. So if we look at the forest cover in the Northeast, we're blessed with an incredible uh, amount of forest cover throughout New England. And um, this has recovered uh, tremendously since being very, you know, almost completely cleared um, with the arrival of European settlers. So we're so lucky that our forests really grew back in a very vibrant way. But if you look at other uh, databases and maps of these forests, they really tell a different story. <laughs> So this is the coal map that's taken from the U.S. Forest Service, and it's based on actual carbon density of New England forests. And it measures carbon density in 2.5 hectare squares, so like about the size of a football field or so. And what you can see is up here in Maine, it's primarily bright green. And down here in Connecticut, western Massachusetts, and southern, sorry, it's purple. And then here in this area, in southern New England, it's quite green. And what this indicates is that the total carbon in Maine forests is much, much lower. It's less than a third of the carbon in these bright green areas. And that's because uh, these forests have not been intensively um, logged for various uses. Um, for example, the paper industry in Maine has been very active for a long time. So our forests are very, very, um, very large carbon sinks right now, and they can continue to sequester a lot of additional carbon because in tree life terms, they're still very young. And if we look at old growth forests in particular, the data shows that old growth forests hold far more carbon even than sustainably managed forests. So if you look here on the left, 
here, um, and this is a paper way back in 1990, and a lot of additional work is coming out to um, re-emphasize and uh, strengthen this point. So you can see that old growth here on the left is much higher in carbon than a managed forest on a 60-year rotation. Oops. And put another way, what we can see is that by managing our forests, we're essentially losing carbon over time. So here's the um, gray area. Is this, this is all carbon that's been lost due to successive management and also due to other factors like fires, pests, et cetera. But it's typically primarily due to management. So I think we need to be thoughtful about where and why we're managing our forests if we're trying to use them as, a, as a, um, one of our strongest tools in the toolbox to have an immediate effect on climate change. Another recent paper um, emphasizes this point in a different way. And it found that worldwide, the largest 1% of trees in mature and older forest comprised 50% of the forest biomass worldwide. So if you look at forest biomass, that's directly correlated with carbon. In New England, it's slightly, um, slightly lower, that it's about 30% um, of the biomass is in the largest 1% of the trees. Um, and one, another important thing to keep in mind is that big trees provide functions that can't be duplicated by smaller, medium-sized trees in terms of habitat, biodiversity, and the large amounts of carbon. Um, Bob Leverett has been doing measurements of trees for um, also about 40 years and working specifically on old growth for about 30 years. And what he's found is that direct measurements of trees demonstrates the incredible amount of carbon that's stored in older trees. So, um, and this is done in very detailed measurements of trees in Western Massachusetts and detailed geometric um, calculations of the complete volume of individual trees and actually complete volume of individual stands of trees um, extrapolated at different ages. And this is one of the um, core principles of why we think proforestation is important. So for, in addition to other values that older forests provide, these large trees are removing the most carbon from the air each year and store the most carbon in their trunk and limbs. So here's some um, and it also increases the soil carbon as well because the root size and kind of the um, other factors are increasing carbon as well. Oops. Oh, here's the data that um, Bob Leverett collected, and this is unpublished. Um, data that he um, has been collecting for years. And this is showing an individual tree um, in Massachusetts that he's been measuring since 1992. And he's also compared it to other you know, trees of different ages. He's basically measuring trees in detail all the time, every day, as far as I can determine. He's a retired Air Force engineer, and now he is a completely dedicated tree measurer, and I'm a scientist. He has more Excel sheets and measurement tools than any scientist I have ever come across. So he's um, really dedicated to this. And he's found some interesting things that, of course, um, the changes in circumference and height go down over time. So if we look at 50-year epoch, so for the first 50 years, there's a big change in circumference and height, and that kind of slows down for the next 50 years and the next 50 years after that, and that sort of corresponds with your impression that the tree doesn't seem to be getting that much bigger every year. When the tree is young, it's growing a lot visually um, in the beginning. But what he found is that the volume of the tree is actually going up more in each 50-year epoch. So this is not cumulative. This is the, the increase, the change in volume during the first 50 years, the second 50 years, and the third 50 years. So what you can see is the tree gained the most volume between 100 and 150 years of age. So this is shown graphically on the bottom, where if we plot can you guys see the bottom of the slide? I'm not sure if it's blocked. It's, this is unfortunate. I'm probably standing right in front of it. Um, but 
Anyway, if you could see the bottom of the slide, then you would be able to see that where is the um, circumference and the height sort of asymptote over time, the volume is still going up, and it's even on an upward slope up to 150 years. And he has trees that he's measured up to 190 years, and they're still cranking, cranking on the carbon. And um, No, the, the volume is the actual wood volume of the tree, not related to the leaves, related to the, the um, wood of the tree. And this doesn't include the roots, which also proportionally would increase with the size of the tree, and doesn't include soil carbon. So this is just the uh, wood volume of the tree. It's not increasing in density, it's increasing in volume. Well, this doesn't measure density, it doesn't um, address density. It's just addressing the, vol the sheer volume of the tree. And essentially, um, a tree that's, um, Ed maybe might be able to help me be specific about this, but I believe a tree that's over 100 years old or one of these huge trees is adding about the equivalent of a 50-year-old tree every year. Yeah, a tree that's 100 centimeters in diameter will add the equivalent of like a 10 to 20 centimeter diameter. Right. And actually, it's probably written here somewhere on this, but it's too distracting for me to try and go through the slides and read exactly what Bill wrote. So I'll see if I can get back to this. So the next slide basically shows, oops. Sorry, this clicker. So basically shows that the um, difference in each epoch is quite significant in terms of how much the tree can add during um, each 50 years. So the additional question is, is it just one big tree or how does this impact a stand of trees? Because of course there's more trees and a younger stand of trees. So Bob's done extensive uh, detailed on-site measurements. Um, he's done chrono sequencing by measuring uh, the width of tree rings um, and, a, and the crown um, area and has used a number of different tools to try and triangulate what would be the change in stand carbon over time. And that's shown here. And what you can see is that while the cumulative stand density over time in purple goes down, so there's fewer larger trees in the 150-year-old pine stand, and this only takes into account every 50-year period. So initially, there's many more trees than there are at 50 years, and they eventually thin out. Um, but the carbon in the stand is going up over time. Um, we don't know where it exactly might asymptote or reach some kind of um, dynamic stasis, um, and that's still a work in progress. Do you, do you have, um, is, is the data similar, say, for a mixed hardwood sand? This, this analysis is a pine that's primarily um, uh, primarily pine, but did include some hardwoods, and he included the volume of the hardwoods in the in the calculations as well. I don't think he's done this full analysis of a hardwood stand, but in general, um, hardwoods do add a lot of volume, and in particular, they have a lot more limb volume than the pines. So Bill's take home message, um, and we're going to kind of have a little panel at the end and have questions because some of these themes might be kind of cross-cutting across our talks, is that one strategy for integrated forest management along with, you know, responsible forestry and, uh, you know, trying to manage for the best way for climate change and doing all the things that we're doing is to really try and focus on where would it be appropriate to let our forests grow. Um, that would allow some of our forests to once again become old growth forests, allow them to immediately have the biggest impact on combating climate change. And um, Ed and Spencer and I are going to also talk about additional benefits of a natural um, approach to forest management. Oops. <coughs>
And uh, while I introduce Ed, I'll just leave this slide up so that you can make sure to uh, see Bill Muma in person when he comes to Trinity in April. So thank you very much, and I'd like to invite Ed to the stage. Um, so what I'd like to talk today about um, following up on the carbon storage of these unmanaged forests are the habitat and ecological benefits of protected wildland forests and how letting nature take its course, though this often gets a bad rap these days, um, can be a remarkably effective approach to achieving a variety of ecological uh, non-timber goals. And so a couple definitions before I get started. When I talk about wildland forest today, uh, what I'm, what I'm talking about are forests that, um, in which no timber harvesting is permitted. Uh, these are largely shaped by natural ecological processes. And under wildlands, there are two additional subcategories uh, that I'll be referring to. Gap 1 wildlands are the most, um, uh, receive the, the strictest protection. Um, these are largely uh, applied to federal wilderness areas as well as more remote national parks and strict nature preserves. Uh, whereas Gap 2 wildlands have somewhat less strict protection, um, in, uh, recreation is a higher priority, that, so there's some limited management associated with, with that. Um, and then managed forests um, are forests in which um, uh, timber harvesting is permitted or at least not prohibited. So managed forests are going to be shaped to a much larger extent than wildland forests by, by human beings. Okay, so this map represents our best current understanding of where wildlands forests are in New England. Uh, the map is still a work in progress, uh, but our best estimate right now is that about five to six percent of New England is uh, managed as wildland forests and about 4% of Connecticut is managed as wildland forests if we combine the gap ones and gap twos. And we're gonna to continue to refine this map over time um, and, and update it as more um, designations become available. But I think it's safe to say that wildland forests represent a small fraction of the landscape today. And so an important question is, do these low percentages of wildland forests really matter? Um, you know, is a wildland designation largely symbolic in terms of its real benefits, or does the condition of wildland forests uh, really differ from that of managed forests on the ground? And if the conditions differ, um, how do they affect the different uh, assemblages of organisms that use these different forest types? National Park Service um, scientists recently uh, addressed this question uh, led by Catherine Miller and they examined the characteristics of wildland forests in 50 national parks across the eastern United States and compared them to nearby unmanaged forests. And one of the things that she and her colleagues found that there was a larger number of large trees and a greater amount of old forests in these wildland forests. And, yep. Sorry, Do you know at what time after management this, these data were collected? So I think it varied because these 50 <laughs> national parks were created at different times. But I would say that when they were created, the, the managed versus the you know, unmanaged forest, the park forest, really had a similar land use history leading up to it. You know, similar forest clearance and, and harvesting. Uh, but I would say in some cases it's many, many decades, in some cases it's fewer, yeah. Um, and large old trees uh, provide tremendous habitat and conservation value to a great number of organisms as we've learned from bryophytes to insects to mammals to birds uh, to amphibians. And one prominent example is the cerulean warbler, which some of you may be familiar with. This is a globally threatened uh, songbird species in eastern North America that uses, specializes in old forests um, that have high canopies and large trees. So Miller and colleagues also looked at tree species diversity and rare species between the two forest types. 
and they found that the total number of species and the number of rare species were usually higher in the wildland forest than in the managed forest. And I think we can agree that higher tree diversity and rare species are conservation values in of themselves, but greater tree diversity is gonna provide greater forest resilience, which is, of course, the capacity of the ecosystem to absorb uh, disturbances and recover quickly from it. And tree species richness is also a good predictor of macrofungal species richness and often leads to increases in insect diversity and bird diversity. And then the third thing that Miller and colleagues found was that wildland forests had a greater amount of dead wood, both standing dead trees and coarse woody debris on the forest floor and then did the managed forests. And so why do we care about dead standing trees and dead wood on the ground. Well, we care because, again, these pr are, provide um, really high quality habitat for a large diversity of organisms from small mammals, amphibians, birds, lichens, insects, and tree seedlings. And one of the, one of the best and most tragic examples of this association between an animal and dead standing wood is the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is uh, our greatest woodpecker species in eastern North America, um, which likely went extinct in the 20th century as a result of a loss of large uh, standing dead trees uh, that were logged in old forests. And on the subject of birds, again, um, Hey, this is a large study recently in Minnesota in the Minas uh, Superior National Forest compared bird assemblages between wild wilderness forests and multiple use managed forests in this national forest. And these authors found that the density, richness, and abundance of individual bird species were all higher in the wildlands forests. And these results I think really tie back to the previous slides in that you know, if you have forests that have a greater structural complexity, uh, greater diversity of tree species, these are going to provide additional niches, additional habitats for a, a wider variety of birds. Okay, so I'm going to turn to invasive plant species. And if you don't like invasive plants, as I'm sure many of you don't, then you should like wildland forests. Uh, this is, uh, our, these are data from a 2018 U.S. Forest Service uh, study uh, that estimated the probability of forests with different levels of protection across the eastern United States being colonized by invasive plant species. And they found that the managed forests had over three times the probability of being colonized by invasives than did the Gap 1 wildlands. And you can see the Gap 2 wildlands are somewhere in between. And you know what would what explains this result? Well, one answer is that the Gap One wildlands are remote, are typically more remote from uh, development and roads, which is going to buffer them more from being invaded by invasive species. But wildlands also tend to have less soil disturbance from timber harvesting and other man management, which is going to provide more resistance to invasive species. Okay, so I'm going to shift focus for this slide to the Western United States for the moment to the subject of fire and its connection to management, which has been pretty prominent in the news in recent years and in the past decade. And the prevailing hypothesis is that unmanaged forests are going to burn more severely than managed ones. Uh, but this really hadn't been tested broadly until recently when uh, Kurt Bradley and colleagues from Arizona uh, examined 1,500 fires over the past 30 years across 20 million acres in the, in the western United States. And they found that just the opposite was the case. Uh, they, they used this burn severity index, which is calculated independently. And the burn severity index looks at um, satellite images of before and after photos of burned areas and the associated vegetation changes that occur in these burned areas and comes up with a burn severity index. And they found that managed forests were significantly, um, had significantly higher burn severity indexes than the wildland forests. And you know what might be explaining this result? Well, if you thin a forest and if you harvest a forest, you're gonna, you are likely going to increase the wind speeds that are, that are going to be passing through this forest. Uh, 
and we know what wind can do to fire. Um, thinning the canopy can also reduce the cooling shade uh, of the forest canopy, which is, can dry out fuels on the forest floor. Um, some level of harvesting is going to reduce tree size, and uh, smaller trees are typically burned more intensively than larger trees. And timber harvesting can leave residual and combustible fuels on the forest floor, and all of these can add to the intensity of a fire. Okay, so at this point in the talk, um, you know, some of you in the audience may be saying, well, you know, these protected wildland forests may have some benefits, uh, but, you know, what about early successional species? How are we, how are we gonna deal with them? Um, and are we gonna have enough habitat for them in protected wildland forests? And while it's true that wildland forests, you know, may not be able to provide as much early successional habitat as intensively managed forests, it's important to keep um, a couple things in mind regarding these species. And the first point is that wildland forests, you know, actually do provide good habitat in many cases for early successional forest species. And we tend to think of these older wildland forests as these deep, dark ecosystems, but they're actually more open than we might think as they develop large canopy gaps, as large trees die and fall, uh, which in turn create patches of dense regenerating vegetation, which birds are gonna use. If we allow beaver to proliferate, um, they're going to create significant early successional habitat, meadow habitat as well, which, is, which birds are going to use. And this study that I mentioned from Minnesota a couple of slides ago, they actually found no difference in early successional forest bird species between the wilderness forests and the managed forests. Um, and they speak to these natural disturbances creating these early successional patches in these forests. And one species in particular, this, the chestnut-sided warbler on the right here, is typically uh, a species that we manage for, uh, but these authors uh, observed this species using these tree fall gaps, uh, using shrubby rock outcrops, and other habitat edges in these wildland forests. And the second point I want to make is that it's also important to remember that the decline of early successional species really um, that we see today reflects a decline from an unprecedented and really artificially high baseline in the early 20th century. So as, as forests were cleared for agriculture in the 1700s and 1800s, and then farm fields were sub subsequently abandoned in the late 19th and early 20th century, it resulted in this vast amount of shrubby young forest and you can see the statistic from Litchfield County. It's kind of hard to imagine Litchfield County with 95% of its forests under 40 years of age. And because young shrubby forests is inherently transitional habitat in New England, it's no surprise that it has declined and so have the species that use it. And I think if we were to compare these species with their pre-colonial baselines as opposed to their early 20th or mid 20th century baselines, then the decline, if any, would be a lot less steep. Okay, and then the third point is that some species that we manage for in Connecticut and New England are actually not native to our region. And the blue wing warbler and golden wing warbler are two species that get a lot of management attention and, and priority in some cases. Um, but these species were not historically here, but only moved east and north as farms were abandoned and all this shrubby young forest that I just talked about came. And so I think it's important to be aware that managing for these species in particular reflects a choice to manage for a cultural species as opposed to one that was historically native. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, it just means uh, that we should be aware of, of what, what we're actually managing for. Okay, and then the last point I want to make is regarding the New England cottontail, which is our threatened species that's largely endemic to southern New England and is considered a young forest specialist. But interestingly, recent studies of this the species show that this rabbit actually uses a broad range of forested conditions, including mature and older forest. And this one study that was um, this 2015 study by Bufum et al. Um, actually found that the New England cottontail, the highest proportion of sites used by the species were in forest as opposed to the more open woodlands uh, 
and open lands and shrublands, which is completely counterintuitive to what we, we usually hear. You know, so this species appears not to be limited to shrublands and young forests, but is, is able to use older forests, particularly those associated with disturbance and canopy yaps, which wildland forests can provide. Okay, so that's, that's all I have at this point. So I'm gonna introduce uh, my colleague, Spencer Meyer, who's senior conservationist at Highstead. Um, so that's a good segue to talk about wildlands and woodlands, farmlands and communities. And this image, this, uh, you may not be able to see very well, I'm afraid with the light here, but this is my thousand acre wood. This one's right down the road from my house and I spend a lot of time here. And how many people in this room self-identify as a critter? So our, the title of our session involved the words critter. And I wanna talk about, and I think Susan's gonna talk about at the end a little bit about how we are also critters operating in this landscape. So in the middle of this image that you, this beautiful image that you can't see, is this roughly thousand acre chunk of woods that's been protected uh, for several decades by both the state and by the local land trust. This is in Guilford, Connecticut, where I live. Um, and there are lots of critters not like us that are operating in that landscape in all kinds of levels in old growth, in old forest, forest that is recovering from the hemlock woolly adelgid um, and all kinds of other interesting ecological elements. But there's also all the critters that live around that and then move through that regularly on a, base, on a regular basis for their own personal health, their own personal enjoyment, and, and all kinds of other reasons. So I want to talk a little bit about the economic connections and the individual human connections to the importance of conserving lands, particularly as it relates to uh, unmanaged forests wild lands uh, across the landscape. Uh, I should say a little bit about Highstead for those of you who aren't familiar. Ed and I both work at this great organization. We're based in Reading, Connecticut, but we work all across New England. And we're really, um, we're really interested in promoting regional conservation that's working with land trusts, working with coalitions of land trusts, uh, working with partners of all kinds and public agencies and otherwise to really advance the different elements of conservation, be that wildlands, woodlands, farmlands, and communities. And we partner very closely with uh, the Harvard Forest, which is based in central Massachusetts, that was our core science partner on a lot of the work we do. Um, and, and together we lead this, this initiative, this vision called the Wildlands, Woodlands, Farmlands, and Communities. So you'll see some uh, familiar. Uh, um, all right, so disappearing forests. Across the whole landscape, if you don't have forests as forests, then you have much bigger problems. And so the vision as a whole is really about understanding what's driving the conversion of forests to development, like this fragmentation or perforation pattern you see in the forest canopy through residential low density development. Um, and New England overall is losing 24,000 acres of forest every year on average for the last two and a half decades. 24,000 acres. That's 3,700, 3,700 acres just in Connecticut every year is going poof because of land use conversions to development or other kinds of uses. Uh, and that doesn't even get into the question that was raised of our commissioner earlier about solar farms going onto, um, onto agricultural lands. This is just forest, 3,700 acres per year. All right, so what's at stake? These are all scenes you recognize in your own communities or from your daily lives. And in addition to all the ecological ecosystem function benefits of losing forest, I wanna talk about some of the human-oriented impacts. And that's because, so I should say, I come from an ecology and forestry background. That's really my training. But what I have learned, to, uh, what I've come to understand is that people are more compelled the more these kinds of conservation issues relate to them, their daily lives, and the daily lives of their neighbors. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about how we as critters, uh, large megafauna, if you will, uh, are interested in advancing conservation in addition to all the obvious and, um, and lesser known uh, benefits, many of which we spoke about earlier today. So this is all on top of all those other ecosystem benefits. I wanna stress that as certainly not an instead of kind of approach. So the downside here is this is what the state and federal agencies have been spending on land conservation since 2008. That's roughly a 50% decline. This is across all of New England. This is simply because conservation has become a lower priority relative to other things. There aren't many people who don't like conservation. It's just that it doesn't maintain, it's not elevated as high enough priority to outfund some other things. And so that's a dialogue we need, we need to fix. And we heard some of that this morning. Simultaneously, the green line at the very bottom is data hot off the press from a survey we did of private foundations across the country who are investing in land conservation of various sorts in the Northeast. 
And what we found is that while uh, there was this decline after the recession, not surprisingly because their endowments got smaller, they have largely recovered. But the kinds of investments they're making in conservation are different there's, now. There's a lot more emphasis on climate, uh, social and community de uh, economic development, uh, parks for people, and those sorts of things, and less about the wild lands and sort of more straight just land elements to it. And so we as conservationists have to do a really good job of integrating all these principles and showing this thing we just protected, we just conserved, it is about the ecological principles, absolutely. But it's also about all these other things that supply our communities with all kinds of benefits. So I want to touch a bit on the connections between health um, and the conservation land. There's been a lot of dialogue for, for quite a long time about how we as critters, large megafauna critters, rely heavily on uh, spiritual and physical health associated, mental health associated with, um, with woodlands and, and other open spaces. And there's been a long history of that and science on that, and Susan's gonna talk to, uh, to us uh, some more of that as well after this. And here's just a couple of you know, headlines from the last couple of years, or few years, that have really dialed in on that. And whether it's in urban areas or rural areas, or whether this, even this idea of existence value, even by virtue of us knowing that these lands exist, we derive some psychological benefit from that, which is bizarre, but true, apparently. So we're gonna talk a little more about that. All right, so here is an academic study um, by some uh, folks down there, including Jeanette Ikovic, who I worked with. Um, she, was, she is at the Yale School of Public Health. And this is a conceptual model which was then tested with empirical data to understand the pathways that link open space over here to all these different measures of health, okay? And so on the right side, you have body mass index, number of chronic diseases, self-rated health. That is when someone asks you how you feel, do you feel like you have any diseases, et cetera, et cetera, how you interpret your own health separate from what a doctor might diagnose about you, and depressive symptoms. And those things are all connected to access to open space through these mediating pathways of physical activity, not surprisingly, the air quality of uh, things you're breathing in, your stress levels, and social cohesion of people that come together, for example, around walking in the woods or walking their dog in the dog park, et cetera. And so this is now an empirically tested model, and I want to show you some results from an economic study we did over the top of this. Um, okay, so, well, before I do that, quickly, one example here is across the Northeast, you can see the amount of pollutants that are removed from forest. If we zoom into New England, our forests remove 760,000 tons uh, of pollutants which is worth economically $550 million a year is what economists have estimated that is worth from reduced healthcare costs associated with, with uh, air quality uh, diseases uh, that stem from poor air quality. Okay, so there's one very macro scale economic uh, impact. Now what we have is this study that we did across a 13 town region, across importantly an urban to rural gradient around New Haven and out along the shoreline, which includes that big uh, overhead shot I showed you at the very beginning. Okay, so the three left diseases, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, based on a community health survey of people in all these 13 communities, we found lower rates of these diseases for people who have access to open space, parks, and other kinds of conserved lands in their communities, whether those are in an urban setting or whether those in a very rural setting. And there's some pretty significant differences there uh, they're significant in a statistical standpoint, but from a magnitude perspective, there's some big differences there as well. Obesity didn't quite pass the statistical test, but you can see it's uh, headed in that direction of being different. So what we want to know is, okay, how many people are not going to their doctors X number of times a month or a year because they have lower rates of these diseases? And we did this both with Center for Disease Control and census data to understand where people live and the rates of chronic diseases in Connecticut in these communities. And we did this in a spatial uh, uh, arrangement as well because we understood that from a bunch of great work the Trust for Public Land has done, we know that people that live within 10 minutes of one of these open space are more likely to use these things and derive benefits from having access to open space. So we actually mapped that in these communities to understand who lives where. So then we overlay the cost of health care uh, on top of that, looking at the reduced rates of hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, so not including obesity because it didn't quite pass that statistical test, 
and you add all that up for the number of people that have those diseases, the fewer people that have those diseases because of access, and what each one of those diseases costs on average per year of doctor's visits and health insurance, and you end up with what's called an avoided cost, money that no one had to pay, of about $37 million a year from reduced health care associated with reduced rates of disease. Now this is just in 13 towns, so that we were really astonished by the magnitude of this effect. Shifting gears. So that's, that's health. That's personal health associated with access. Let's talk about drinking water for a minute. This is a well-known study at this point by the US Forest Service called Forest of Fossets that's trying to understand the benefits that forest, which naturally filter the water as it percolates through the forest and through the soils, ends up in the reservoirs and eventually in our drinking water taps. These are the forests that are most important for drinking water because water flows through these forests to drinking sources and which are threatened from development on private lands. So the darker the color, the more likely forests are to be impacted by development, forests in particular which provide drinking water benefits. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. We're in a bit of a hot spot, as you can see of that. Okay, and so on your left here, you have this conceptual diagram of the benefits, the services society is getting by forests that are naturally filtering our water. If you think about the economic benefit of not having to treat that water as much, or in about 50 cases around the country, not having to filter, filter your water at all because the, the water is so healthy already. The famous example uh, is New York City watershed. Well, we're really interested in this dynamic because we think there's a lot of co-benefits that go with the, this water, and therefore there's all these beneficiaries that together could be investing in more conservation for not only water, but the co-benefits of carbon, biodiversity, health and well-being, some of which we've already spoken about. So for one pilot project, we're working with a group of organizations in Maine on something called a water fund. It's called Sebago Clean Waters, and where the water utility is investing in land conservation deals in their watershed because they get the economics and the other social values of keeping that forest as forest, which is actually reducing their annual operating costs. So they've been doing that for several years, and now we're working together to develop this water fund to bring other large water users that get their water from that watershed to uh, co-invest in this kind of conservation as well. Let's shift gear and talk about local economics. So this is a really exciting piece of work. Some colleagues and I, led by Kate Sims at Amherst College, uh, one of our colleagues, Jonathan Thompson at the Harvard Forest, and um, Chris Nolte, Boston University, uh, and Josh Plazinski, Harvard Forest. This study is coming out on Tuesday in the journal Conservation Biology, which is an odd place to talk about jobs. You don't see a lot of talk about jobs in an ecology or biodiversity journal. But the reason this study is coming out in that journal is because what we did is we wanted to know are communities that investing in their open space, reinvesting in their community assets, um, are they also getting economic benefits in addition to all the conservation ecological benefits? So we looked at the rates of protection uh, from 1990 to 2015 even, using the same data that Ed showed some examples of, the maps around New England that we've been working on for several years. We looked at the rates of development on a per town basis. And because it's such a big data set, we could do this for all of New England and cover all but a few towns, covering 99% of the, all the population in New England. Okay? And then we looked at the economic data from Bureau of Labor Statistics on rates of employment in these same communities over time. And when you add these two things together in a very large data set, it allows you to control for all kinds of other factors like uh, local employers coming in and out of business, um, for um, government policies in individual towns. It allows you to get rid of all that, those other covariates, if you will, and try to understand a causal link between land conservation in communities and the number of jobs in communities. And what we found is a small but very important effect. That is the number of people employed in towns that have higher rates of conservation have gone up in the five-year period following the rates of conservation. The total number of people in the labor force, which is both people employed and people looking for work, also goes up slightly. So not only do a higher percentage of people have jobs, but there are more people that are coming to these communities that want to work, that is to say not just children and elderly. The unemployment rate um, was not significantly reduced, and very importantly, the housing permits, so the last figure, the last thought there is the number of housing permits was not depressed. So you might say, okay, well, we conserved a bunch of land and we locked out development. So yeah, you get some more jobs, but you actually, actually decrease economic development associated with building homes. And that is not true, as it turns out, in this region-wide data set. <laughs> 
which is really interesting. So for a town with 20,000 people, an increase from 10 to 15% of your town protected, which is well within the normal bounds of many of our communities in Connecticut. So it's a 50% increase, but it's still only going from 10 to 15%. That leads to an increase of 1.5% increase in jobs, which doesn't sound like much, but that's 300 additional people in that community that are gonna have jobs because that community has, double, has added 50% conservation lands. But I want to highlight a few resources. We realize that sort of academic research and kind of the nitty gritty details don't make their way into decision makers very often. So we've just uh, launched a sort of new initiative to try to do a better job of distilling both the information we produce originally with our colleagues, as well as information that's already out there in all these reports and gray literature and stuck on someone's shelf somewhere, and bring it to light in these very digestible formats. So on our Wildlands and Woodlands org site, we've launched this new series of briefs. We have three so far with a few more uh, coming out soon. They're trying to distill some of these natural infrastructure, these ecosystem service, those are all buzzwords you're probably familiar with, concepts into how they benefit communities, whether it's related to the cost of community services work or whether it's related to the healthcare or some of these other elements. So we have those resources available. And one more quick resource we're very excited about, but I, so I want to mention it to you, but we don't have time to talk about, is this new future landscape scenario tool that our, our friends at Harvard Forest have just launched uh, with our help. It's called newenglandlandscapes.org, and it's this really fun interactive map that allows you to use that blue thing in the middle and toggle it back and forth and understand what our community is, our landscape looks like today, and what it might look like in the future under different conservation and development scenarios. And these scenarios were developed with stakeholder focus groups from each of the six New England states over a two plus year period uh, with very uh, um, sort of a visioning process to have conservationists say, what do you imagine in the future? And then under a range of these future scenarios, you can see how that plays out or could play out in your town. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And I think my final slide is just uh, uh, my email address in the Wildlands and Woodlands website. And um, our communications director, Cheryl Daigle, is in the back of the room. And we have a booth down across the hall, I believe. And we would love to talk to you about any of this work or any of the other things um, Ed spoke about uh, that we do. That's it. All right, thank you, Spencer. Um, I'm going to try and uh, go through my talk fairly quickly and hope that we might have some time for questions at the end. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, I also have a table under um, Keep the Woods and a lot of the original research that I'll be presenting today. I also have copies of it at the table, as well as flyers with the um, events that I mentioned and some other materials, so please feel free to stop by and pick those up. So, um, my talk today will be about forests and brain health, and um, in my, most of my working life, I'm a professor at Trinity College, I'm a joint appointment in neuroscience and psychology, my PhD is in biology, but this year I actually applied um, for a grant to combine my vocation and my avocation, which is forests and clean water, and I applied for a grant at Harvard Forest to do a fellowship on forests and brain health. So that's what I'd like to share with you today. And I'm going to focus, uh, touch very briefly on three what I think critical aspects of forests and brain health, um, which I title today, Movement, Minds, and Medicine, to kind of follow up on the alliteration of climate and critters. And I'd first like to acknowledge some of the community organizations that I've worked with over the years. Um, we have a very active uh, Safe Routes to School partnership in our town. Um, we worked with the Trust for Public Land to protect a forest in Simsbury. Um, I've been uh, one of the founders of Keep the Woods. And um, I'm also a proud member of the Grange. If anyone wants to talk about the Grange, please stop by my table. And um, I consider my work at Harvard Forest kind of the intersection between my uh, community work and my um, academic work. Oops. And what I'd like to give to the land trusts that are here today and also emphasize about my approach to my work is I really feel like brain health should be a priority for our public policies. 
Um, and I think that it should be a part of our public education, and I think it's a big platform for support for public land. And it really um, can happen through our national efforts, our local and regional land trusts, our state efforts, any town land, and any kind of p tiny piece or connector can really make a difference. And I found that through the Safe Routes to School program, a little tiny easement can help connect to kids to a pathway that they can walk through the woods the entire distance to school. And what I'll show you later, um, very briefly, is that Harvard Forest just discovered 16 new, uh, a teaspoon of soil from Harvard Forest just yielded 16 new species. So even a little tiny thing could be really important. <coughs> So um, my main job is as a neuroscientist. I know that our brain is very adaptable and dynamic. It's a very complex ecosystem in a way, kind of like a forest. And I really have a great appreciation for complex ecosystems and um, their resilience and capacity. So one thing about our brain is it must maintain homeostasis. And I know from my research work that healthy metabolism is really essential to prevent, recover from, and even reverse pathology. And I consider healthy metabolism in the brain almost like money in the bank to help to prevent problems. And my core principles in my biomedical research and also my approach to forests is we want to make sure that we have kind of a first do no harm approach where possible. It's really becoming more and more clear that prevention and lifestyle are some of the most important tools in the toolbox. Um, we don't have any cures. We don't even have any good treatments for some of the most devastating and serious and costly neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease. As a neuroscientist, I can tell you there are really none on the horizon in any time course that's gonna even help me. Uh, I really, it's a very difficult problem. So um, we need to try and be preventative as much as possible and couple kind of non-toxic um, approaches that can have therapeutic benefits. And the other thing I mentioned, I just clicked over it, but we really, to have natural um, processes be beneficial, we need to um, allow for time. So with metabolism, it can have both very short-term effects in neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, and also long-term effects, so changes in um, gene transcription that can translate to lasting benefits and even reverse pathology. Um, in my regular job, I work on the ketogenic diet, um, which was discovered in 1921, and we're just now starting to understand how it works and what might be the disorders that it's beneficial for. It was initially prescribed for epilepsy. It's still effective even in cases of epilepsy where none of our available therapies work. So um, hopefully, you know, this is a very long time. We're almost at 100 years. We still don't know how this works. And I just wanted to make an analogy with forests that our ancestors lived in the forests. Um, and there's a lot of historical literature talking about melancholy and uh, benefits of forests. Um, and recently, you've probably heard about Shinrin-yoku, um, Japanese forest bathing. That was sort of coined in about 1982. A term prior to that was ecotherapy. And I just wanted to share one um, term that my Swedish friend, who's a pediatric neurologist, who's very interested in this forest and brain health work, she said in Sweden, if you want to tell someone to get lost or even a little bit more forceful than that, you would tell them, dra at skogen, which means go to the forest. So that's kind of a nice way to tell someone to get lost. <laughs> so, and I'd like to say that linking forests and brain health is a very rapidly advancing topic as far as, as rapidly as science can advance, which I'll tell you is really not rapid. Um, and, but I'd like to say that for things that aren't toxic and we think might be beneficial or we know are beneficial, I think we should have a different standard than a drug that needs to go through placebo-controlled um, trials. So if we think something is beneficial and we know it's not harmful, you know, we need to throw every tool and toolbox at it. And the National Health Service in the UK has a motto um, called Growing Forests for Health. And I think that's really, should be a really new, um, a major platform in forest conservation. Um, just to give you a tiny evolutionary perspective, I try and have an evolutionary perspective, both on, both on my neuroscience and in my forest work. Um, the molecules that I work on, adenine and adenosine, have been around for, oh, three billion years or so. Photosynthesis and metabolism, um, adenosine triphosphate, couple billion years. And about a billion years ago, we got multicellular cellular organisms and a really massive explosion of biodiversity. And what we realize now is that forests 
and evolution in general are evolving faster than we thought. And that's good news because the world is changing faster than we you know, may want it to. Forests evolved a long, long time ago. Um, back here in the Carboniferous period, which was about 380 million years ago. So they've been around for a long time. You can see our human predecessors, predecessors showed up around 5 million years ago, and then we've only been around for 40, 50,000 years. So we're just such a tiny blip in evolution. And during that time, there have been some pretty bad things that have happened. Ice ages, volcanoes, asteroids, some pretty cataclysmic events. Um, that look nice in these movies, but I'm sure they weren't if you were there. And um, the forests have managed to survive through all of that. I mean, even they, they formed when we were still one big continent, Pangaea. And I would like to emphasize that we really need forests more than they need us. So just to go through some of the evidence on mines, uh, movement mines and medicines, I wanted to start with a couple of quotes um, and emphasize the benefits of a little place, a little place that belongs to you. Um, and Roderick Fraser Nass said, wilderness is not so much a place, but a feeling about one. And every, and Thoreau said, every town should have a park or rather a primitive forest for instruction and recreation. So to talk a little bit about movement, um, not everyone can do some obstacle course or bear gorillas or survival thing. So I decided to focus on something that most people can do, which is walking, and why it's the most underrated form of exercise. There's thousands of articles on why exercise is good for your brain. Um, so I decided to focus on one that is um, not talking about um, what we typically think of with brain health and exercise, but to talk about creativity. And what is the evidence for um, nature and creativity? And this study looked at four different measures of creativity, and it looked at sitting, and it looked at walking, and it looked at this either indoors or in outdoors. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. First of all, walking increases creativity a lot, and that was measured by a, a scale that looks at divergent thinking. So convergent thinking is kind of typical uses for something like a wheel is on a car. Divergent thinking is um, high quality, non-traditional, um, uses. So one example was a wheel wouldn't be used as a pinky ring but could have some other <laughs> creative uses. So um, divergent thinking was greatly increased um, by walking and it was increased whether you walked after you sat as shown here or if, if you walked and then you sat the benefit was still maintained um, after the bout of sitting. Um, you can see it's low if the, there was just an order of events where you sat and then you sat again. And it was high if you walked and then you walked. So walking in general is beneficial for creativity, but what about being outdoors? So this um, looked at two different measures, and one of them was dynamic sitting while outdoors. This is akin to being pushed in a wheelchair. So um, this, I think, is another take-home message for people who have mobility impairment. Um, what could be the benefit for being outdoors? So when you're pushed in a wheelchair, this was this dynamic outdoors. This was had a significant increase, almost as high as walking outdoors. And walking, in general, was shown to have a high effect. But I thought sitting and, and just moving in a wheelchair outdoors, increasing your creativity was very um, interesting. I'm going to highlight a couple points about minds in general. And one of the things we always talk about with um, forests is the ecosystem services. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and this is uh, to highlight um, psychological ecosystem services. So as a neuroscientist, I don't see any distinction between the mind and the brain. So when I talk about psychological ecosystem services, I really mean brain benefits. Um, there's research on both the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, in veterans and also in teenagers. So wild experiences in nature has been shown to lower PTSD in veterans. Um, other studies have shown the ability to lower medication use. And uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is a very difficult uh, condition to treat. And there are some very, very moving quotes from veterans saying, you know, this our natural heritage, this is what I went to fight for. And they really have a very high value on these natural places. And another offshoot of this study 
and this is an um, article published by the Sierra Club, is the healing power of awe. So awe is the feeling that you have where, when you're in the presence of someone larger, something larger than yourself. And the most uh, common awe-provoking experiences are nature or maybe art. And the commissioner talked about awe this morning, which I thought was really interesting. But what they found is that these natural experiences that provoke awe um, are very powerful, and awe is correlated with um, more pro-social behavior, so you're friendlier, you're more empathetic, you have better ethical decision-making, you're more cooperative, and you're less narcissistic. So I think there's a really a lot of kind of community benefits associated with experiencing awe. On the East Coast, when they redid Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, they included a project that was two acres in the middle called the Green Road. And this was an area set aside to be a natural healing environment for um, injured service members and their families. And some of the quotes associated with this are very moving also. My war is over, battles are only memories, nightmares that I sweat out during the dark of the night. The woods is serenity, hope, and intrinsic light that pulls us deep inside so we can observe her beauty. The idea is just being in nature all by itself will heal. We want to test if wild nature does heal, and you just provide the nature, and the mind takes care of the rest. And this is um, from Dr. Frederick Foote. He's a neurologist, retired from the Navy, um, and has been administering this project at the Institute for Integrated Health. And some of the markers that they've been looking at, they're looking at five main classes of quantified um, changes in veterans, and one of them is biomarkers of stress. One is uh, uh, often uh, measured by salivary cortisol. Um, they're also looking at natural language analysis, so looking at what veterans are thinking and feeling. And um, finally, they're also looking at changes in gene expression. What are the changes that gene in, in gene expression that might correlate with long-term um, healing in this population? So um, hopefully we won't be having a lot of additional injured veterans, but we are having an increased urbanization. So right now, 50% of people worldwide live in an urban area. That's going to be going up to 70% predicted by 2050. And urbanization itself is associated with mental illness, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. and. Um, what they found is that uh, in a lot of uh, mental illness is associated with negative ruminative thoughts. And I found this paper very interesting where nature experience reduces rumination and activity in an area of the prefrontal cortex that is associated with this negative thought pattern. And what they found is that after a 90 minute walk in nature, self-rumination decreased significantly. So here you can see the decrease in self-rumination after nature versus after a 90-minute walk in an urban setting. And the really interesting thing about this study is they found that the self decrease in self-reported rumination matched the change in blood flow that they found in the nature versus urban setting. So here's the scan they here for, have here for functional imaging, and you can see the corresponding decrease in that activity in the natural setting. So what about other properties of the brain? We looked at, um, there's some biomarkers, some functional activity. What about structural changes in the brain? So I work with rats and mice in my lab, and we have known for a long time that if you raise these laboratory animals in an enriched environment, it has significant structural and functional implications in their brain. So these researchers wanted to say, okay, what is the relationship between our environment and our brain structure? And can we study this in the human population? And um, structural changes, obviously, are also things that can help build resilience and um, prevent disease and promote function. And this study was done um, in Berlin, Germany. And they cataloged different types of landscapes. So they had forests. They also had parks. Um, they had urban areas. They had water. And they found a positive relationship between living within one kilometer of forest and amygdala integrity. So this was specific to the forest setting. And the amygdala is an area of your brain that's essentially assigning and interpreting emotional valence to um, your 
all the inputs from your environment. It's often associated as a fear center, a, sig a center that would signal fear, but it's really a, a something that can uh, assign any kind of emotional um, relationship to things in your environment. Actually, it's connected to the prefrontal cortex that we were just talking about. So the last thing I want to talk about is medicines, and I'm sure I'm super short on time, and I'll make this really quick, and I do have these papers um, at my table if you'd like to see them. But this is actually what I think is some of the most exciting um, opportunities that we have in our forests. And we know that our forests were probably our first, and I think should be our future pharmacy. I think it's almost it's so irresponsible the lack of attention that we've given to chemicals that are provided by nature while we put on our lab coats and think that we're going to design something in the laboratory. Um, so one of the most common compounds is terpenes. I'm focusing first on terpenes because they can be inhaled, they're a volatile compound, and they're very plentiful in the forest. And um, this is an example of a pinene, which is one of the terpenes. And there's both laboratory and forest-based evidence in humans for benefits. And these are in three broad categories. Immunological, so anti-inflammatory, also some um, effects on kind of markers of osteoarthritis. Um, oncological, they seem to have a cytotoxic effect in that it's specific to cancer cells, so obviously that's a highly desired trait of any cancer therapy. And also neuronal benefits, neuronal protection and regulation of gene expression. So the neural protection is associated with reduced um, reactive oxygen species, so antioxidant benefits. And this regulation of gene expression is something that can offer the kind of resilience disease prevention that I've been talking about. And one thing that's great about terpenes, you probably can't read this, is they are small, they're fat soluble, they're highly abundant, and they're very high in conifers. So if you have something that's small and fat soluble, that's great for brain health because um, they can cross the blood brain barrier and our brains are really made of a lot of fat. So having something that's fat soluble is really good for penetration into the brain. Oops. Um, and this is just an example of some of the compounds, um, alpha-pinene, beta-pinene. And this is also a compound that's in rosemary and mint and sort of those aromatic things that you might think of. But it's not just the trees. And that, I think, is a real take-home message from this um, session is that the forests are so much more than the trees and we really need to think about getting dirty, what's in the soil, what's in the plant layer, and what are those benefits. We are still discovering new species and I think that this is really our best hope for discovering new medicines. Bacteria and fungi have already provided two-thirds of our current antibiotics. And I mentioned in the beginning this teaspoonful of soil. This is where um, they just found 16 new giant viruses um, in Massachusetts. So giant viruses are quite interesting. They have all kinds of genes that we don't even know what they do. Um, and just in that teaspoon of soil, they found enough to expand the phylogenetic tree by this colored area. So it was a real significant increase in the biodiversity, and they're still examining it. I was particularly proud to find out recently that um, the girls at the Ethel Walker School, which is in my town, and the Ethel Walker Woods is the forest that I help to protect with Keep the Woods, they're involved in a national, they're only one of five schools involved in actually an international program to try and use citizen science to develop new antibiotics. Antibiotics are the worst drug for a drug company to invest in because hopefully you'll take it once and you'll be cured. That's not a money maker. So we need to find you know, strategies for public funding or citizen science to really um, develop new antibiotics. So the girls are in a biochemistry class. Um, it's in conjunction with Yale, and I think it's called Tiny Earth or Small World Initiative, and they're trying to isolate um, new antibiotics from soil. Now, in my um, research sabbatical at Harvard Forest, I contacted um, someone who works in epilepsy, Steve Schachter, and I know that he has been working on forest botanicals. It turns out that his um, drug is just now being licensed with Biscayne Pharmaceuticals, and it's going to be a new drug for epilepsy and pain. We think it might be more effective than any of the other drugs that we have right now and might actually offer the benefit for a disease modification. It's isolated from a Chinese club moss called um, Huperzia serrata, and it has this um, anticholinesterase uh, 
um, inhibition qualities, and that's also beneficial for Alzheimer's, and it's kind of been touted for that for a while. But what Steve Schachter has found is that it also um, has an indirect effect on GABAergic function. So GABA is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter and something that you want to augment if you have epileptic seizures. Now this interesting thing about this being a Chinese club moss, the more I've read about what are the plants that we have in New England, there's a lot of Asian analogs for these plants. And uh, Dr. Carl Goldcamp shared with me um, some slides about that, including one about Asa Gray, an American botanist, that found that New England flora closely re resembled Asia even more than Europe or the Western United States. And she wrote in 1959 to Darwin, it is almost impossible to avoid the conclusion there is, there's been a peculiar intermingling of the Eastern American and Eastern Asia floras, which demands explanation. And she noted in particular Japan, Northeastern China, and Korea. So we know Chinese medicine has a very long history, one of the possible explanations is when the continent, uh, giant continent Pangaea spoke, broke apart and we were in the supercontinent Laurasia here in the northern hemisphere, we were essentially juxtaposed to this, to this region and perhaps that could have some evolutionary relevance to the similarity of our plants. Um, and I think this is really an opportunity that we haven't taken advantage of in this area. What are the medicines that could be in our local forests? So I was particularly shocked when I went out with um, Bill Moorhead, who's a well-known rare plant person in Massachusetts. And I didn't know even what a club moss looked like. And so Bill mentioned, I said, oh yes, the guy I'm working with, he's been looking at this club moss. He said, oh, there's a club moss. And I said, oh wow, that's kind of interesting. At the end of the hike, he said, oh yeah, it's a Huberzia. I said, Huberzia, that's what Steve is working on. So here's a picture of um, one of the club mosses that we saw that day. And Steve's evidence um, in these mice, and it's now been taken into clinical trials, has very, very powerful protection against seizures. And this mutant mouse with um, SCN1A, it's the same genetic mutation in Dravet syn as in Dravet syndrome, which is a um, devastating um, epileptic condition, which we're now getting better therapies. And that's actually one of the, um, CBD oil is the, one of the therapies for Drave. Um, so just to wrap up, I really think that there are a lot of restorative opportunities, um, co-benefits. We, we all know, of course, clean air, water, climate, um, health is a major benefit. Um, it's our natural heritage. The forests are a a landscape that's available to the majority of the population. Um, to humans, it provides recreation, quiet, and a sense of awe. And the high biodiversity, which increases over time, could produce new medicines. What can land trusts do? So this is my wrap up here. I think that it's really important to establish an intentional strategic plan for natural forest ecosystems versus managed land. And you might say, well, how would I make that decision? I'm on the Open Space uh, Commission in Simsbury right now, and we're trying to make those exact decisions about where would we prioritize to leave intact as a natural ecosystem. And what we're trying to do is focus on core interior forest. Um, naturally, you would focus on slopes, riparian buffers, corridors, wildlife corridors that are going to need, we need these corridors for when species need to migrate for climate change. If we don't have these corridors intact, we're going to be inadvertently extirpating species or else we're going to have to put them on trucks like Noah's Ark to move them to the forest, you know, 100 miles north or something. Um, we need to protect ecoregions and tier one matrix forest. Um, we should really prioritize areas without invasives. It's an, if an area doesn't have invasives, you don't want to risk bringing it in. And also areas where there's a high public interest in that area being kind of a forest that people feel a real connection with. I think we should have public education about this balance between manipulated versus natural areas. And we need to know that nature needs time. So it may not look perfect at all times, but we need to be patient and appreciate that dynamic. Thank you. Um, I really think that this is a new opportunity for land trusts, um, for outreach and fundraising opportunities, and for advocacy. And Connecticut could really be a leader in this goal. Um, so some of the possibilities to do this, um, Northeast Wilderness Trust um, is a trust that focuses specifically on forever wild easements. 
It's my understanding that CLCC is having a session on a new forever wild easement for Connecticut right now, competing with our session, um, but that will probably be available afterwards. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, I'm the Hartford County Coordinator for the Old Growth Forest Network, and Simsbury just dedicated Belden Forest as a member of the Old Growth Forest Network. So this doesn't provide any legal protection like an easement, but it does essentially um, affirm a community value that this is a forest that we want to be left to be managed by nature. And Belden Forest is only a tiny forest. It's 40 acres in the middle of town, but it's old and it's a real gem. And it's next to our library, the Veterans Memorial, Boy Scout Hall, and a church, and a bus stop. And you know, it's just really gonna be a special place for people to enjoy generation after generation. And then another thing that I'd like to hope will be um, used more broadly is in the carbon markets, there's often a net carbon benefit of the sale of carbon credits. Um, but I've found at least one project so far in New England that was actually um, used for what, what um, they term wild carbon. So this is an area, uh, Burnt Mountain, in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. It's a project done by the Nature Conservancy and it's 5,400 acres. It's gonna be left entirely as a preserve. And for that uh, status of preserve, um, this land is getting over $2 million over 10 years. It's 5,400 acres. So this is not something that's available right now for small parcels, but it might be something that land trusts could bundle land together or bundle with private landowners. I think this is gonna be a very shifting dynamic, but one to keep an eye on is a way to um, you know, preserve these values we've been talking about today. And, and that's it. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.